myself, the South African saga. And this has given me an opportunity, I think, just to try to consolidate my feelings and my thoughts about the country that I still love and that I left a long time ago. So um, anyway, so here I am, and there's Edith from Africa. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> um, well, when you hear the term South Africa, what word comes to mind? What's the first thing that pops into your head? Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela, yeah, absolutely. Anything else? <laughs> the rainbow Jim country. Quincy. Sorry? So the first word that pops into your head when you hear South Africa. Oh, of course. Well, history. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, what we're going to do is, what I'm going to try and do is just to draw um, sort of polarity between apartheid, which I think is what most people associate South Africa with, and then Mandela because there is there's a dichotomy between the two and yet they are just so interconnected and so closely associated. Well, to begin with, um, there's a snapshot of South Africa which might just acquaint you with some of the, the details about it. It's a country with 60 million people. This is the latest census. Black Africans, 49 million. What in South Africa is called colored, which is mixed race. Um, white people, five million. And of that group, 60% are Afrikaners, which are descendants of the Dutch. And then finally, the Indian group, which was one million. And Indians, um, I don't refer to them very much there because there's so much else, but Indians were brought in as indentured labor in um, 1866 to help with the sugarcane fields. So they're a very active group in South Africa. They contributed enormously. Um, to what we today call the Rainbow Nation. There are also five million illegal immigrants, and they are the butt today of xenophobia. Um, they suffer, I think, enormously. That they've made an enormous contribution to the country, but they um, they are targeted by South Africans who feel that their jobs are threatened. Another thing about the country is it's got the highest income equality inequality in the world. The Gini index is 63. Australia is half of that. It's got the third highest crime rate globally after Venezuela and PIP and PNG. 67 murders a day, which is a rate higher than Mexico or Colombia. One in four men admit to rape. I told my daughter this, I've got a daughter who lives in Cape Town, and she said, oh, it can't possibly be. Then I checked it on the internet and um, that was put up by Amnesty. So that figure is real. One in four men admit to rape. 40% unemployment. Um, that's using the expanded definition, which is people not looking for work. Um, youth unemployment is 64%. And the country has a life expectancy of 64. <coughs> but apart from these rather sad statistics, South Africa does have, it's, it had enormous achievements. It's had 10 Nobel laureates. Um, it's had two for literature, and it's had four for the Peace Prize. It's also had four science laureates. I'm not going to mention their names, and all of them sadly have left South Africa. It also had the first heart transplant in the world, and um, my daughter in Cape Town told me the first penis transplant, <laughs> which I didn't know. Um, South Africa is situated at the southern tip of the African continent. It's one of the most beautiful, yet troubled parts of the planet that we all share. And to understand the present, it's necessary to look back. And as William Faulkner, the American novelist said, the past is never dead, and it's not even past. South Africa's past is characterized by violence and dispossession. And in the words of a fellow migrant from South Africa, the Nobel laureate, J. M. Kutsia, who currently lives in Adelaide. He wrote um, a memoir, and this is an extract from it. The ground beneath his feet, that's Kutsia's feet, is soaked with blood, and the vast backward depth of history rings with shots of anger. Many South Africans, whites especially, turn away from the trauma, choosing to live in a state of oblivion. 
rather like the character in Jane Concier's 1986 novel, Fleur, and this is a quote, we must cultivate all of us a certain ignorance, a certain blindness, or society will not be tolerable. White South Africans, speaking from my group, often express a nostalgia for a world that has passed. And so there is an impasse. There's a stubborn refusal to acknowledge debts owed to victims of a system that created monstrous privilege. The guilt and anxiety felt by some white people is nothing, however, compared with the centuries of suffering borne by black South Africans. The trauma began in 1488, when the Portuguese sea captain Bartholomew Dias rounded the southernmost tip of the continent, and that's it there, Cape Point. That was called the Cape of Storms, and it's also called the Cape of Good Hope. And in a way, that contradiction is what characterizes the country as well. It's a country of turbulence, but also of incredible hope. South Africans live very resilient, and they live with a perpetual hope that things will come right. The Portuguese established the first global empire. They were followed by the Dutch in 1652 and by the British 150 years later. The Dutch East India Company was set up as a refreshment station for sailors at the Cape, and they displaced the local First Nations people, the Khoi and the San. They were pushed into the arid north, the Khoi and San people refused to be um, workers on Dutch farms, and so as a consequence, slaves were brought in from Madagascar, Mozambique, and East Africa. And these slaves were hired out to Dutch farmers, um, who are known as Boers, B-O-E-R-S. And just by the way, the transatlantic slave trade was the largest forced migration in history. It displaced 12.9 million people. Apart from the Portuguese and Dutch, the other big player in the country was Britain. Britain had a, a, a company called the British East and India Company, which made its money initially by trading slaves, but also silk, cotton, and spices, which came from India and Indonesia. And the company became an agent of British imperialism. For five years, between 1795 and 1802, Britain annexed the Cape for strategic reasons. It wanted to prevent France from taking over Dutch-held territories. You know, Europe's always been at war. I mean, just look at it today. It's a, I mean, if, if any <laughs> continent is uh, soil is red with blood, it's, it's that of, of Europe. Um, so the Dutch and the British fought a battle at the Cape, and the victorious Britain established the Cape Colony in 1806. In the meanwhile, the French Revolution had happened, and there were new slogans like liberty, equality, fraternity, and with that came the rights of man. But because South Africa was so isolated, this kind of passed the Dutch by. These Dutch farmers who were kind of in a sleepy little camp area, um, didn't really come to, it's, it's as if the enlightenment just passed them by. They weren't a fan of things, you know, concepts like equality or democracy. So they were very um, sort of narrow-minded, very God-fearing people. And when Britain came on the scene, they felt threatened. Their slaves were going to be taken away. These would belong to them, you know, Britain had no right to take them away. So what they did, 12,000 of them got into their ox wagons with their wives, with their children, and they trekked, the word T-R-E-K, is a Dutch word that comes from that period, the great trek happened. Um, and they went into the hinterland. And as they moved further into the hinterland, they encountered um, black tribes, tribes that were pretty warlike and pretty angry. Um, you must have heard of the Zulu. They encountered them. And there were many, many savage battles that were fought. In one such battle, the Battle of Blood River, the Boers held off a massive Zulu army. And because they were successful, they believed that God had 
rewarded them. They saw themselves as God's chosen people. They were people of the book, the words were. And, and they, 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 they persisted in this search, almost as a sort of the lost child of Israel, looking for territory that could be theirs, where they could find their own independence as a people. They even renamed themselves. They called themselves Afrikaners. And that comes from the from Africa, obviously, A-F-R-I-K-A-N-E-R-S, Afrikaners. So they were Europeans who had assumed an African identity, and they felt that the land belonged to them, you know, which sounds outrageous and extraordinary, but that is what happened. And they eventually established um, two republics, um, and they were pretty poor republics. They, the Boers struggled. Um, they were pretty bankrupt. And then in 1870, something happened that totally changed the history of the country. Diamonds were discovered. And a man called Cecil John Rose came on the scene. He was a visionary, he was ruthless, an entrepreneur, and he saw Africa as territory that just belonged to him. And this image, which is um, it's a cartoon from Punch, which is a satirical English magazine, is based on um, the idea of Julius Caesar, who was a colossus, a giant, who bestrode Europe. And here you've got Cecil John Rhodes striding across the African continent as if it belongs to him. And his aim was to build a railway from the Cape to Cairo. And so that that territory could become that of Britain. And it was, a, it was an extraordinary vision. And he was absolutely ruthless. He, just, he founded a company called the British South Africa Company and um, became extremely wealthy from diamond mining. He founded a company called the De Beers Mining Company, which is still the world's largest distributor of diamonds. And then, you know, not content with that, he then just carved out a section of the continent to the north of the Boer Republics and called it after himself, Rhodesia. It was absolutely, I mean, just astonishing. The um, confidence on the one hand, the arrogance, the ruthlessness. He did this. And he would negotiate with the local tribes, play one against the other. And um, I mean, just the extraordinary fact that you can call a, a part of a continent, a large part of a continent, after yourself. Um, Interestingly, he was gay, he didn't have any heirs, um, and his vast fortune from diamonds was eventually poured into the Rhodes Scholarship Trust. So I don't know if any of you are Rhodes Scholars or have any ambitions to be, but that money comes from, <laughs> from Rhodes's, um, yeah, his activities in South Africa. It was a very strange period in history um, Africa was seen as territory which was there for anyone's taking. Um, the scramble for Africa began in 1884 at the Berlin Conference. European powers simply grabbed bits of Africa and they carved it up like a pie. There were only two neutral territories eventually by 1914, or um, territories that had never been occupied, and that was Ethiopia and Liberia the two great territories virtually opposite each other. But you can see how, the, how Africa is virtually pink from the Cape all the way to Cairo. So Rhodes' ambitions were coming to fulfillment. The mining industry quickly developed. It relied on a mining, on, on a, a labor system which had prison-like compounds. And you can see here where black laborers are literally, that's where they slept, those concrete sort of troughs, almost like what you would put chickens or pigs in. Those were their, the men's beds, their clothing hanging up. They were kept in a compound. They were not permitted to leave. Um, they were virtual prisoners. They did the dirty work. You can see them standing behind. In the front are white miners. Many of those were Australians, by the way and they came and were there in a supervisory capacity. Um, but this, this is probably 
the blackest, the bleakest, um, one of the bleakest parts of the country's history. People who were literally treated as, as beasts of burden. They were not permitted to have their families with them. So consequently, families broke up um, and that had a, a lasting impact and effect on family life in South Africa. The men went to work in, in the mines because they um, the Boer Republics had brought in systems of taxation and so had the British. So these people were expected to pay taxes. If they didn't, they would be in prison. And so they, they, it was forced labor. They had to go and work in the mines to earn money to pay their taxes. It was a, a vicious circle. Working conditions were hot, they were unhealthy. Um, eventually, in much later, miners worked as far underground as four kilometers. And if they complained, there would be severe consequences. In 1894, a group of troublesome miners were shot dead by police in collusion with mine owners. This would repeat itself in later history, and not too long ago, a couple of years ago, President Ramaphosa gave the go-ahead to trigger-happy police to shoot striking miners. So this is something which is almost in the DNA of South Africa. Gold mining isn't what it used to be in South Africa. South Africa used to be the top producer in the world. It's now number eight. The first three gold producing um, countries are China, Russia and Australia. But Africa is still seen as a source of abundant raw materials, gold, platinum, bauxite, um, coltan, whatever that is, and also cheap labor. So there are many countries that, like Australia, which, <laughs> like Australia, which um, prospect in Africa and mines which are currently active. So this, these are mines on the ASX, which are currently active in Africa. So it's a new kind of scramble for Africa. But anyway, to get back to South Africa, the saga of South Africa, the battle for minerals developed into a bloody conflict between Boer Republicanism and British imperialism. And this resulted <coughs> in the Anglo-Boer War in 1899 to 1902, which was the bloodiest con armed conflict in South African history. The whole might of the British Empire was pitted against two small Boer Republics, uh, the South African Republic and the Orange Free State. And by the way, Australian soldiers fought on the side of the British during that war. And they are commemorated um, in Anzac Square here in Brisbane. Interestingly, this was the first, the world's first guerrilla war. The Boers introduced trench warfare. Lord Kitchener retaliated with um, scorched earth policy. He would burn down in retaliation, in reprisal, um, Boer homes, houses and livestock was burnt and this resulted in um, also the, the building of concentration camps because the men were fighting the guerrilla war and the women and children were herded literally into the world's first concentration camps and there you can see them and the children and what's interesting to me i mean i'm not a, an afrikaans speaking south africa i don't have the same sort of emotional um, attachment to this particular history, but the resentment about what happened in the Boer War runs deep in, in uh, the whole psyche of Afrikaners, today even. And there's an enormous amount of anti-British feeling um, and a suspicion of British values, of, 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 of just things like you know, concern for equality and so on. These camps um, held 150,000 whites, and there were also camps that held blacks. And the reason that blacks were put into concentration camps was to stop them, to prevent them from supplying the Boers with provisions. The um, casualty rate in the concentration camps was 28,000 white women and children, and 20,000 Africans who were accused of collusion. So the casualty rate was, was massive. And this long war, three years, the Boers eventually capitulated 
and Britain was victorious and enjoyed the spoils of war. And we've just seen quite a lot of that on television recently. The big diamond here is called the Star of Africa. And the diamond at the base, that big squarish diamond, is called Cullinan II. In 1907, the world's largest, clearest diamond at 3,100 carats, apparently it's the size of a man's fist, um, was gifted to Edward VII by the Transvaal, by the One Boer Republic, which by that time was under the influence of Britain. It was cut up and used in the crown and in the scepter. And there's a, a, a lot of resentment about that. It's quite interesting to see people's reactions, especially black South Africans during the um, funeral of the Queen recently when this was on display. And they want repatriation of those gems. I mean, these jewels are beyond value. Anyway, soon afterwards, soon afterwards in 1910, the Union of South Africa was formed. It consisted of two former Boer republics, the Transvaal and the Orange Free State, and then the two colonies, the British colonies, which was the Cape and Natal. So the Boers and the, and, and, the, um, and, and the British came together and they pulled together this country, which was now called the Union of South Africa. Blacks were not consulted at all. Um, they were completely sidelined. So it was a country for white people. And of course there was a, a repercussion. Two years later, the continent's oldest liberation movement, the African National Congress, was founded. And, and we, I mean, that, that was momentous, absolutely momentous. The next year, there was the sort of cause and effect, cause and effect throughout the history. The ANC was established in 1912. In 1913, the Nations Land Act was passed and the government pushed 80% of the population onto 10% of the land. And this issue of land remains the source of South Africa's woes. Um, the president of the ANC at that stage was a man called Sol Plaiki, and he lamented, I woke up a stranger in the land of my birth. He petitioned Imperial Britain to appeal against the, the Nations Land Act but it was to, to no avail whatsoever. And what the consequence of that um, forced removal of people was massive land dis dispossession and huge poverty. And, the, and what the government had effectively done was force the Africans into the wage economy. They were deprived of their livelihoods, they, they didn't have land for their cattle, and so they, many of them migrated to towns. But in the towns, they lived on the periphery. There was what um, the French called a cordon sanitaire. So there would be the town, and then there would be a no-go zone, zone, sort of a, an exclusion zone around the, the town. And then beyond that would be the township for black people, who basically were the labor force for people living in the city or in the town. And in this way, a servant class developed. And because white people needed um, this black labor, once again, a whole series of laws were passed. So this is during colonial times, during, uh, under Britain, the Urban Areas Act, which regulated the presence of Africans in urban areas. And they would, anyone who was deemed to be surplus to the economy was deported to African reserves. They also brought in the Calabar Act because you couldn't have racial mixing. Um, the Calabar Act also protected white jobs, and the Immorality Act prevented inter interracial marriage. During this period under colonial rule, British rule, Afrikaans became an official language, Afrikaner nationalism consolidated, and the name Afrikaner um, signified the claim they made to the land, establishing their identity also as non-Europeans, this lost tribe in Africa. 
three years after the end of war, World War II, the National Party, which was anti-British, pro-Nazi, won at the polls and entrenched white nationalism and white supremacy. And this resulted in increased African resistance. There was a sort of inevitable rise of two nationalisms and white liberals feared the consequences of apartheid, which is pronounced apartheid, by the way. And what Alan Payton, apparently his, um, his this novel, Cry the Beloved Country, was actually set in Australia um, a couple of years ago, but it was on the school syllabus, which I find interesting. And Payton has a black character say this, I see only one hope for our country, and that is when white men and black men, desiring only the good of their country, come together to work for it. I have one great fear in my heart, and that one day, when they are turned to loving, they will find that we are turned to hating. The triumphant National Party has given the world a new turn, apartheid, and it then the government passed a whole lot of laws, primarily to preserve racial purity. And foremost among these was the Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act, which was passed the year after the National Party came into power in 1949. So maintain racial purity at all costs and white supremacy. The following year, the Population Registration Act was established and racial groups were separated into whites, um, colored, colored people who were mixed race, uh, Indian, as I said, and black people. Um, colored people went through horrific, excruciating tests um, to establish whether they were white or colored. And one of those tests was the notorious pencil test, where people literally had a pencil stuck into their hair, and if the pencil fell out, they were deemed white. If the pencil stuck in their hair, sort of shoved, you know, to the, above your ear, if it got stuck there, that showed, that proved that they were not white. So they were put into the colored category. There were just an, an enormous amount of this sort of cruel um, behavior. And then another, Act was passed, the Group Areas Act, which separated living areas. Black people had to carry a, a, a document called a passbook at all times. Um, they were aliens, literally, in the land of their birth, uh, you know, carrying a passport. And the world looked on in horror at all this. And the UN General Assembly passed its first resolution against apartheid. Um, th 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 things were being noticed. The world was reacting. The government felt increasingly besieged because during the Cold War, um, Russia had come into the picture, Soviet Union, as it was, and there were many people in South Africa, in the African National Congress itself, who um, felt sympathetic towards many of the ideological views of the communists. And the, con the, the government immediately passed um, the Suppression of Communism Act. I mean, that, that happened in America, it happened in Australia. And this resulted in widespread bannings and exile. The reality of apartheid was felt by Africans who were trapped in the system. Um, this is Ezekiel Mbachlena who wrote um, an autobiography and one of the, you know, in, in, in the book, um, one, of the, one of his family members, he's a character in the book, says, black man cleans the streets but mustn't walk freely on the pavement. Black man must build houses for the white man but cannot live in them. Black man cooks the white man's food but eats what is left over. Don't listen to anyone bluff you and say black and white are brothers. An enormous amount of growing bitterness which is expressed there. In a further refinement of the, student, of the system, homelands were established, which came to be known as Bantu stands. Bantu is an African word for people, so there were 
the, the, the whole edifice of apartheid was being strengthened. So separate homelands were established for each of the country's ethnic group groups. The government wasn't only um, satisfied with separating black and white races, they then started separating African tribes into separate groups. Um, and some of them are mentioned there, the Venda, um, the Zulu, the Indabele, um, the Sutus, Tosa, there were a whole variety of, 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 of different um, groups. And it was almost Orwellian because the, 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 these weird sort of entities, and you can see how scattered they were, um, were, were described by H.F. Wurt, who was the architect of apartheid, as indicating good neighborliness. That, that, that's how he described it. And he said that these people were being given the opportunity for self-determination, that within their own homelands, they could now develop their own um, identities, they could have their own factories, their own systems, their own schools, etc. And yet they weren't solid pieces of land. They were so scattered, so fragmented, so there was no possibility whatsoever that they could ever become productive and that people could sort of, you know, just live decent lives. Um, there was a discriminatory education system which limited um, the opportunities of people and this became an increasing sort of Shobudian nightmare. Black trade unions weren't recognized. And at this point, again, reactions caused it caused a reaction, and the anti-apartheid struggle began in earnest. <clears throat> in 1952, a young lawyer called Nelson Mandela took part in a countrywide defiance campaign. And in 1955, the, uh, a huge convergence of people, a meeting of people, was held in Free State, which is in the center of the country, and 3,000 people came, assembled from all over the country and drew up what is known as the Freedom Charter. And these were its basic tenets. The people shall govern. All national groups shall have equal rights. The people shall share the country's wealth. And, and that's the exclamation mark. The, these were demands. The people shall be, sh the land shall be shared among those who work it. All shall be equal before the law. All shall enjoy equal human rights. There shall be work and security. The doors of learning and culture shall be open. There shall be houses, security, and comfort. There shall be peace and friendship. I mean, enormously um, idealistic. And this, I mean, many of these tenets have actually been um, woven into South Africa's constitution. To me, that's almost like poetry, really. And after the Freedom Charter was drawn up, more than 150 people were arrested and charged with high treason in a case that lasted for four years. There were no convictions, however. The government became increasingly paranoid. It banned the ANC in 1960. When they banned the ANC, there, there was no access whatsoever to anything the ANC printed, you couldn't quote their leaders, you couldn't even have photographs of any of the um, banned people. The first time I saw a photograph of Nelson Mandela was in about 1989. I didn't know what he looked like. You know, and I lived throughout that period. So these people were erased from history. And there was also just what's important is that there was no television in South Africa until 1975. Ish. It was about 1975. So South Africa was really, the, the country was isolated from the outside world. There was, um, there were various groups that were beginning to be formed, the um, anti-apartheid movement in, in the UK. And the ANC went underground. Mandela himself went underground. And because nothing had really benefited black people, um, the armed struggle began. Um, the ANC's military wing was established in 1962 
and had embarked on a sabotage campaign which included the bombing of electricity substations. Um, in one such event, African and black people who were forced to carry these passports um, burnt them. They got together and in a, a township called Sharpo, a black area, they burnt their passports and the police retaliated immediately and they shot 69 fleeing protesters in the back in a massacre that shook the world, that shocked the world. Um, interestingly, Albert Lutumi, who was the, um, the president of the ANC at that stage, compared the government with Nazis, but he pragmatically advocated non-violence. And for that, he was awarded the Peace Prize. Um, another consequence of that was at the UN Security Council, there was a resolution which called on the government to abandon its apartheid policies. The reaction was, the government's reaction was to declare South Africa a republic in 1962. So the reaction was one of defiance. And it was a, again, it was a the sort of end result of all those dreams that the Boers had had um, the previous century of having their own land, their own country, their own republic that came to fruition. South Africa left the Commonwealth, again, this increasing isolation. But it happened, um, ironically, at a time when other African countries were beginning to gain independence, and um, Ghana being the first. At this time, Mandela was rearrested, and he was convicted of attempting to end apartheid rule. When he was convicted, he read a three-hour statement from the doc. During my lifetime, I've dedicated myself to the struggle of the African people. I fought against white domination. I fought against black domination. I've cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It's an ideal which I have to live for and to achieve, but if needs be, it's an ideal for which I'm prepared to die. It's become um, a speech which is really in the in the annals of history. Ten years later, in 1978, the apartheid was declared a crime against humanity. It was uh, it was sponsored by the Soviet Union and Guinea, and it was passed by a large majority, with four countries against it. And the four countries were South Africa, Portugal, the UK, and the US. Well, anyway, the 30 years later, this, these were the effects of apartheid. If you look at land allocation, for example, black people 30%, whites 87%. Average earnings, blacks one, whites 14. Number of doctors per population, for black people, one to 44,000. For whites, it was one to 400. Infant mortality, 20% in urban areas for black people, 40% infant mortality in rural areas. Whites, 2.7%. Annual expenditure on education per pupil, for black people it was $45, for whites it was 696. So this enormous inequality, it was not separate development. I mean, that's what Kavut and the National Party and the government tried to sell it as. The part that was good neighborliness. Um, you know, we're all equal living in our own little areas. Absolute nonsense. In the 1970s, the black consciousness movement began. And a charismatic young leader, Steve Beaker, declared, black man, you're on your own. Simmering anger boiled over when the government tried to force Afrikaans on black students. Tried to force um, Afrikaans students to learn in schools through the medium of Afrikaans. And they were having nothing of that. 1976 saw the Soweto uprising. And this iconic photograph of a young boy, I think he was 13 years old, called Hector Peterson, being carried by his brother. And during the Soweto uprising, police and army killed over 600 people, mainly school children. Many of them left South Africa to join the armed struggle, which was being waged from across the border in other African countries. Sanctions and boycotts were biting, 
an increasingly desperate government was trying to co-opt colored people and Indians into a new, what is called tricameral parliament. So, you know, having divided and ruled, or tried to divide and rule black people, it was now trying to divide and rule um, groups like the coloreds and Indians as well, trying to bring them into this tricameral parliament, but it left out black people, it excluded them. There was enormous black anger at this, and this gave rise to a movement in the 80s, which was extremely important, called the United Democratic Front. The ANC leadership at the time, almost like a leadership in exile, was based in London with support from the Soviet Union. And it began to wage a campaign to make the country ungovernable. Willie Mandela, Nelson's defiant wife, declared, with our matches, with our boxes of matches and our necklaces, we will liberate this country. And you probably know what the necklace is. It's a tire which is hung around a person's neck, filled with petrol in the bottom half and then matches thrown into it. It was a horrific way of dying. Um, so the, I mean, the, the, the violence in the early 80s, right up to the late 80s really, was absolutely horrific. It was dreadful. There were many, many um, black people suffered because there was this fear of collaboration. Um, and people who were regarded as being collaborators uh, were severely punished. Violence escalated. Whites were conscripted to fight in what had become the border war against what the government described as the total onslaught of communism, Soviet aligned forces. It was a, the country was an absolute mess. I mean, I actually can't believe that I lived through that. And my daughter did too. It's, just, it's extraordinary to think that you actually lived through a thing like that and somehow managed to survive. A state of emergency was declared. There were bannings, imprisonments, the curtailment of civil liberties, people were thrown into jail, thousands of people in a day were just thrown into jail. The economy was weakened enormously, there were international sanctions, it suffered increasing isolation, there was an academic boycott, a cultural boycott, um, foreign pop stars, singers, artists, musicians were not allowed to come into South Africa and God help me if they did, because there were severe consequences. So white South Africans were being increasingly isolated. I mean, the country was in a state of absolute desperation. Morale was in, at an absolutely low ebb. And then 1986 was a kind of turning point. It was a, what an author has described as a pivotal year, and it really was. Um, the, the country was in a state of virtual collapse. And Mandela entered secretly into negotiations with the government, with the white government. And in a confluence of events, after the Soviet Union fell in 1989, um, which weakened the ANC, the white president de Klerk seized the opportunity for a negotiated settlement. It was either war, I mean, all out war, or otherwise giving something away so that peace could be gained. And then in an extraordinary act, um, one Saturday morning I was actually sitting in a lecture at this university. And the news came to you that Mandela was freed. I mean, it was, it was like, it was an, uh, an absolutely unbelievable moment. And him together with other black consciousness aligned movements, and there were many, Chief among them were the Pan-Africanist Con Congress and the Azanian People's Organization. They were not, um, they weren't followers of the ANC strategy, which was non-racialism. These um, groupings were far more radical and they didn't want white members, they didn't trust white people, and uh, there was a fallout with the ANC at that stage. Um, but in the meantime, the Pan Africanist Congress and the Zampo, as it was known, had actually withered. They'd, they barely exist. Mandela was elected president of the ANC and he went into alliance with the South African Communist Party and the, the sort of an umbrella organization of trade unions. 
and then um, the big change happened. Multi-party negotiations began, there was a new anthem, there was a new flag, and I was just extraordinarily privileged to be part of the process of what they called um, the Commission of National Symbols. There was a new anthem, a new flag, and it took about three months for those things to be finalized. And instead of a race war, there was this protracted negotiated settlement. And in 1993, Mandela and Dakar were jointly awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. In 1994, the first democratic elections had a voter turnout of 87%. I mean, that must be a record, I think, globally. And people stood, they'd waited forever. They stood in the hot sun in these long, snaking queues, and they voted for the first time. It was a, a truly extraordinary moment. Black people and white people who had been forced to use separate entrances, separate beaches, etc., were now standing shoulder to shoulder and voting. And while I suppose one could say that the Rainbow Nation was born at that point, a new constitution came into being which safeguarded human rights and equality. <coughs> this was followed by a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The process took seven years. Amnesty was granted to people who confessed to their crimes. But sadly, there were no reparations. And of course, if there isn't, if there isn't reparation, not much healing takes place. And that has been the legacy of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, Mandela retired after one term in office. He was followed by Thabo Mbeki, his AIDS denialism caused 300,000 deaths, by the way. And Becky introduced um, a far-reaching policy called Black Economic Empowerment, and um, what in South Africa is known as CADRE deployment, C-A-D-R-E, CADRE deployment, where loyal um, government supporting, uh, uh, ANC supporting people are put into top government jobs. So a sort of system of patronage began it's understandable, obviously, there was a need for affirmative action, because if you think of it, apartheid was a mass affirmative action for white people for 40 years. And Becky was now trying to correct the balance with black economic empowerment, but the sad thing is that it only benefited elites, really. It didn't trickle down. Um, after Mbeki, a wily opportunist, you probably all heard of him, Jacob Zuma, who was described in the courts as an incorrigibly corrupt demagogue, seized power in 2008, and despite rape allegations and arms deal corruption findings, he encouraged a form of um, corruption, which is called state capture. He would put powerful business people, um, people who supported <laughs> him, not necessarily even the ANC, but his own personal supporters into positions where they took part in the country's decision-making processes. It was extraordinary. There was a group of Indian people, a family of um, Indian brothers, the, the Guptas, who, um, who virtually ran government from their, their home in Johannesburg, uh, colluding with Zuma. It was quite amazing. They occupied powerful positions in the electricity supply system in various um, state-owned enterprises. And what the legacy of all that has been is that ESCOM, the Electricity Supply Commission, has virtually collapsed. The rail network has virtually collapsed. And the postal services, which is responsible for um, giving people their monthly grants, has also, it, it's, it, it's virtually non-existent. It doesn't function. For years, um, Zuma has eluded jail. He's in, engaged in what South Africans call lawfare, not warfare, but lawfare, with protracted court cases. They go on and on and on forever, with appeals, etc., etc. And when he was eventually um, convicted and sentenced last year, his supporters waged a <coughs> social media campaign, and there was a devastating insurrection, the president, Ramaphosa called it an insurrection, which left 400 people dead 
with billions of dollars of distraction. So the AMC promise of a better life for all have come to naught. President Ramaphosa has not fared any better. And his 26 promise, when he came into power, of a new dawn has become a South African nightmare. The former trade unionist is today a billionaire with close mining connections. There are many SOE, state-owned enterprises, for example, energy, oil, um, which are kind of milk cows, really, for, uh, for cadres, for, 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 for members of the ANC. And this has resulted in was virtually a failed state. Um, and countries become failed states because of the legacy of extractive institutions. Institutions like South Africa's energy companies, which are state-owned, which concentrate power and wealth in the hands of those controlling the state, opening the way for unrest, strife, and civil war. Uh, and that description just strikes me as being so apt and so accurate um, to describe the process of state capture, really, and, and, uh, you know, and, and patronage, really, which has virtually milked the country dry. In what seems an endless repeat, there was another massacre not too long ago. And this was at a place called Marikana, which is a platinum mine. Workers were demanding um, a wage increase. Rock drill, they're called rock drillers. They, it's a very specialized job. They were earning $500 Australian dollars a month. And they demanded an increase to 1,200 Australian dollars. I mean, it's pathetic. Um, absolutely crazy. Um, they were refused. The strike went on and on for weeks. And Ramaphosa, who was at that stage a deputy president, but also a non-executive director of the London Mining Company in London, gave a police order for concomitant action against the mine workers. 34 of them were shot dead again while running away. And that seems to be a South African speciality with the police. No one was charged, not a single case has come up, and many widows are still awaiting compensation. Promises are continually broken, there's a culture of impunity, black resentment and anger are matched by white disregard and guilt. And an author who has just won the Man Booker Prize, I don't know if you know it, but it's the most prestigious prize in the world, um, wrote a book called The Promise. And this passage to me just says so much. It's, um, it's a young black man speaking. After 30 years, the promised house is given to a servant woman and her son. And Lucas, the young black man, says to this woman, it's nothing, Lucas says, smiling again in that cold, furious way. It's what you don't need anymore, your leftovers. It's not yours to give. It already belongs to us, this house, but also the house where you live and the land it's standing on. It's ours, not yours to give as a favor when you're finished with it. Everything you have, white lady, is already mine. And you can take the house as a kind of symbol or an allegory, really, for the land, for, for the country as a whole. The policy vacuum which was left by the ANC was soon filled. And there's been an emerging group called the Economic Freedom Fighters, and their policy focus is the land. And their inspiration is a person they call Mama Africa. That's Willie Mandela. And as the, the banner state, her spirit lives. She's the inspiration behind this group of very young people, largely, who are members of the um, economic freedom fighters. And of course, what's happened is that people have realized that um, you know, liberty and freedom without economic freedom is, is nothing. It's just, it's, it's empty. 
so this this group has gained a lot of popularity. Um, unfortunately, the leader of the group is a, a bit of an opportunistic populist, and time will tell what the consequences are there. Um, in the 29 elections, this is what's happened. From the, the ANC in the first elections in 1994, um, had a majority of 67%, it's dropped by 10% to 57%. The other two um, main parties are the Democratic Alliance, which is which was formed by the whites a while ago, but which is multiracial now. And then the Economic Freedom Fighters, which have gained 10% of the vote. In the last elections, many did not register. Fewer than half of eligible South Africans cast a vote. And to me, that is uh, so telling. Fewer than half bothered to cast a vote. So that hard won vote in 1994 has lost its, its value. And in a poll, 67% of people said that they were willing to give up elections if a non-elected government would provide security, housing, and jobs, because that's what they don't have. I mean, to give up your vote for that kind of security. So clearly, democracy without equality is meaningless. And while democratic rights were extended to the totality of the population after the end of apartheid in 1991, extreme economic equalities have persisted and been exacerbated. Post-apartheid governments have not implemented structural economic reforms, including that. And a functioning democracy requires security, but the police are corrupt, the defense force is in a critical state of decline. There's no food security. 27% of children are stunted. And the energy system is in a very powerless state. There are ever-increasing electricity blackouts, which indicate that the national grid is failing. This affects water supply. It affects sanitation, food production, internet services, banking. So it's had an, an, an extremely um, pervasive not knock on effect. Uh, this this ESCOM crisis is horrific at the moment, the Electricity Supply Commission. And uh, the, the term load shedding is a South African term for blackouts. So you can see how the number of hours um, per year, you know, has, has um, the, the graph speaks for itself. People are very often without electricity for six hours a day. And um, and it's affected water supplies too. A city like Johannesburg, there are areas in Johannesburg which haven't had water for days, I mean, four to six days, it's, uh, people are angry. But like all countries, the elite remain largely untouched. They live in their gated villages. And South Africa has almost more, um, I think it's got the second <coughs> highest number of gated villages after the US in the world. People live in their gated villages, the lights stay on with their diesel generators. They remain cocooned with excellent private schools, excellent private hospitals. So this doesn't really touch them. It's a country of two nations. And as the wealth gap widens, frustration and trauma grow. And we've seen this before. Chinua Achebe, the Nigerian writer, wrote, a long time ago. Look at our coll collapsing public utilities, our inefficient and wasteful parastatal state in companies. If you want electricity, you buy your own generator. If you want water, you sink your own borehole. Well, that, that's South Africa today. And in this tale of two countries, white economic power persists. The richest company is Anglo American mining, the richest person. There's a man called Johann Rupert, eleven billion dollars to US dollars to his name. He's a white man. But there is a changing social order because a black oligarchy has begun to emerge. The richest black person is a man called Patrice Motsepe. 
who happens to be the brother-in-law of President Ramaphosa. Motsepe owns the 12th largest gold mining company in the world. And apart from this oligarchy, this emerging oligarchy, there's also a huge kleptocracy. And the motto seems to be, it is our turn to eat. The ANC national sp spokesperson, a man called Snaps Ngonyama, was recently questioned about a kickback he received from a telco deal. And he said, I did not join the struggle to be poor. South Africa's psyche has been beset with fear since the exile years of the 1960s. The simmering violence of the Soweto uprising caused Nadine Gordimus, fictional character Maureen, to state in 1981, this is what Maureen says, they had thought of leaving then while they were young to make a life in another country. They had stayed and told each other and everyone else that this and nowhere else was home, while knowing as time went by, the reason had become that they couldn't get their money out. Maureen's little legacy of De Beers shares her maternal grandfather had left. The house, which was less, worth less and less, and had less and less opportunity of selling, as city riots became a part of life. Those are very prophetic words um, of Nadine Gordon, who was one of South Africa's um, Nobel laureates. She won the, uh, the prize for literature. To date, almost a million South Africans have emigrated to other countries. That's 915,000. Of these, nearly 200,000 have left for Australia. They include Marius Kilpers, the former CEO of BHP Billiton, the world's largest mining company. Gail Kelly, the CEO of Westpac. Robert Holmes, of course, Australia's first billionaire, apparently. David Gonski, a public figure and businessman. Craig Rucastle, a media personality, and Anton Enos, who you probably saw on SBS from the Yeti, all South Africans. And of course, there are the others that have left for other countries. I mean, Elon Musk getting up to all of his tricks. The challenge for South Africa is how to avoid the fate of corruption plagued countries like Nigeria and Zimbabwe. Because what corruption does is it erodes trust, it weakens democracy, it hampers economic development, and it exacerbates inequality, poverty, social division, and the environmental crisis. In 2022, the Commission into State Capture in South Africa issued the following warning. What is abundantly clear is that for as long as the ANC is in power, the failure of the ANC successfully to reform and renew itself, as undertaken by President Ramaphosa, will render the South African state unable to rid itself of the scourge of state capture and corruption. This was delivered about just a couple of months ago. And it's a severe indictment on the president of the country, who is just enormously um, inactive, inert, and the question for all South Africans is, what is to be done? And I've just made, noted a few points. The first is to abandon cadet elect deployment, to stop putting your own supporters into positions of power, particularly in state-owned enterprises. Institute a universal basic in income, which would help to eradicate poverty and crime. Now that's redisputed. Fix spatial segregation. South African towns and cities are still enormously segregated. And create a public transport system. That public transport system is non-existent at the moment. The, the, the train system um, has collapsed entirely. And people rely on taxis for transport. They can't get to work. Land redistribution. Whites own 72% of agricultural land. That was a 2017 audit. And the government has taken some action with a new, very controversial bill 
for the expropriation of land without compensation bill that has been passed with a lot of noise being made about it. And then finally, perhaps that very controversial uh, last resort of a, of a wealth tax. Um, South Africa does have a fairly standard progressive income tax uh, system and the top, uh, I think it's 45%, but more needs to be done, I would think. And if you have any ideas, let us know. <laughs> I was just wondering, with the victory of the end of apartheid in apartheid in the 90s, why was land reform not pushed? Why was it not? Was it considered, or or was it just not implemented? In the 1990s, yeah, um, there were protections for whites. Remember that you had this power, still powerful government negotiating with a, um, a group of people who'd been in exile for years a ragtag army really, and um, their position was really pretty weak. So they had to make a lot of concessions to the white government. And one of those was to safeguard white property, the property clauses. It, it would never have passed otherwise. So property rights were guarded by the new constitution, which is why this new bill is coming. Um, I mean, whites still own pretty much most of the country. But there wouldn't have been a settlement without that concession. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, I've been doing work in South Africa mm -hmm. since you know, before that election. Uh, so I've been going backwards and forwards for you know, all my career. So I've experienced a lot of that history, but it's all perfectly fine. But I think with the, with the land reallocation, you know, with the people I talk to, um, it was the example of Zimbabwe which was the problem. Yeah. Uh, because you know Zimbabwe went from you know, essentially the breadbasket of, <coughs> of Africa, and uh, and so they you know took the land without compensation, kicked the white farmers off, yeah. and, and redistributed to their cronies, uh, and uh, productivity just collapsed. Yeah. I, I think that. that it's that conundrum, because uh, it isn't just the land. Land by itself does nothing. Mm -hmm. You have to have by human capital, it's knowledge, experience, yeah, yeah. and all that sort of stuff. And unfortunately, that's in the white farmers' heads. It is, yeah. Uh, I forget, was it Mozambique that set up a system for these, you know, the, the, particularly the white farmers out of um, Zimbabwe who were thrown off, uh, they were given land, yeah. and, and then as long as, and then they put like, four farms around them that were owned by blacks and they could get their land for yeah, free yeah. if they trained the four black farmers around mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. and I think that was extraordinarily successful yeah. because it, it was a recognition that it's not yeah. just the land, yeah. it's, the, it's what's in people's heads. And it's the expertise. It's the expertise. You, I mean, you can't just go and farm. Yeah. Because yeah. just giving the land out it just collapses yeah. the productivity. And another thing is that most black people don't want to farm. You know, they, yeah. they, they want to live in cities. They, they've urbanised. Yeah. And, but the land carries enormous symbolic value and yeah. emotional value. So but black symbolism people, doesn't feed it. No, but, <laughs> but it's there, it's there. Yeah. So it's a, Why it's don't a, the blacks employ the whites? Sorry? If the blacks own the land, why wouldn't the blacks employ the whites? Why, why would they employ why the whites? Why wouldn't they? Well, there were very few whites. I mean, there were five million yeah. whites. So. And, and, and if you ever talk to If they're the ones with the knowledge, they can um, you know, there have been lots of initiatives in South Africa where actually Afrikaner farmers, who are the pretty, you could call them conservative, racist, but they have gone into partnership because they can see the writing on the wall. They've gone into partnership with their black workers, mm -hmm. their black laborers, and they've created cooperatives. And, and, and this, this is going on now, but there isn't enough of it because you've got to transfer the skills and the capital. You can't just dump people on land and expect them to farm. And it doesn't work that way, yeah. And, so this was, and, that, and I think that was the big break because yeah. Zimbabwe showed where you just dump the land on people yeah. and nothing happened. Yeah. yeah so that, 
They just went back to subsistence agriculture exactly. yeah. and boom. Yeah. And, and not that they wanted even to be there. Yeah. As you said, you know, yeah. they wanted to be in urban environments. With but what, I mean, what the ANC could have done mm -hmm. is what the Afrikaners did. They created a land bank. Mm. I mean, Afrikaners really uh, thought out very carefully because they had been poor whites during straight after the Anglo Boer War. They were poor people, impoverished. Mm. And when they got into power, they created their own banks, their own institutions, all for the value, you know, for the advantage of their own people. But they got capital together, they got money together, and they helped their own people to stay on the land, you know, to continue to be farmers. And without that capital, it could never have worked. It did. So, I mean, in a way, I think what the current government has done, in the same way as the, the National Party government dumped people in homelands, what Ramaphosa's government does is just dump people again, mm -hmm. leave them to their own devices. You know, there's been so little in the way of assistance um, for black people. Um, and there's a lot of suspicion also there was an African bank um, that actually got looted and Julius Malema, who's the leader of the um, can, <laughs> this party that I was telling you about, um, economic freedom fighters, um, he was implicated in the looting of uh, African, um, African banks. So it's, 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 it's highly problematic. Um, it's as if people who've been deprived for so long um, kind of lose perspective and a lot of them have, I think, lost perspective entirely and it's become all about themselves, you know, their families and they've lost, in a sense, a sort of view of the country as a whole and of their own people, their own people's needs. Yeah. So, <clears throat> Zandra, my understanding is that, uh, in the bigger picture, South Africa avoided a civil war. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, sometimes when these things are presented, we forget to give credit where it might be due to a process yeah. which occurred in that country, uh, very <coughs> unique in yeah. historic yeah. terms. Yeah. So, if you were to say that the slow decay of an incoming system for a young country, it's only 40 years, basically. Yeah. Must be given more time. Yeah. In terms to evolve. I yeah. mean, Raposa is obviously aware of all this yeah. stuff, but he can't do it in two years or one year. And he sits his head out too far, uh, you know. Yeah. It, 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 like, what, do you, what do you feel in terms of it evolving to a more successful Look, I, I don't think it's going to stay like this forever. I mean, definitely not. I'm not an Afro pessimist at all. At all. Um, I think that this is just it's a slump, it's a trough that the country's got into, and it's, it's got to put itself out of it. But it needs to make a lot of changes, you know, economic changes, economic policy changes, because one of the things that happened during transition was the economic system stayed in place. You know, the whole sort of capitalist superstructure just stayed in place. Um, there was very little change. Um, people were afraid. People were afraid of investment, investors being chased away or whatever. Um, so I think, I mean, in a way, um, South Africa became the victim of its own negotiations process success because it didn't demand at the time or enable real change. But that, I think, will happen in time. It must. Do you think that might work in tandem with the rest of the African continent, particularly with China coming in and being involved in yeah. development? Do you think there could be, like, some of the world trade membership? Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm really, I'm not qualified to answer that. I mean, who knows what China's doing? China's putting a lot of money into Africa, a lot, a lot of infrastructure. And obviously it's gaining influence. Who knows what its long-term plans are? So it's another, perhaps another form of colonization, economic colonization. Yeah. It, it seems almost like the Adela Mange really got a present in terms of um, getting votes out there for people to make some change, but then it stopped and almost went to the other side again with the new government, and it's almost declined again. But would a lot of the blacks don't seem like they had the education because it's so long where they haven't had rights. Could have been in their hands had they had that. You don't know what you don't have. What 
Yeah, yeah. But a lot of South African people I know don't like the way it's being run, and I wonder is there any change happening there? Like, there's not many females that are rich, <laughs> let's be honest. Do you feel as a female in that climate when you were there that you had much ability to change, or does that segment change even do you think now? You mean as, as a white person? Hmm. Or even no. just generally, like, there can't be all white people. Yeah, okay, it's, right, but it's all people must have. South Africa is an extremely, um, it's such a weird country of contrast. If you were there now in Cape Town, you would be having a ball. I mean, beautiful weather, gorgeous scenery, people, you know, driving in their luxury cars along the promenade. Um, that's 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 half of it, and and white people tend to be the elite <coughs> still, so they live these really easy lives, most of them. Um, and I, I flashed up one of the, I think it was Katia, who said that people just, to survive, you've got to become blind. I mean, otherwise you actually go crazy. Um, if you, and, and there are, <laughs> there are many South Africans, if you know, look at social media, I mean, people are extremely angry, extremely unhappy. White people as well as black people. But there, there doesn't seem to be any mechanism, you know, for them to channel that anger. They, they've lost faith basically in democracy and that's a phenomenon we can see in other countries as well. There's just an enormous amount of unchanneled anger or apathy. Which seems like a wonderful time when somebody with the right ideas and suggestions to unify the country could come in now yeah. and make rapid changes in those areas. And I think I mean, a lot of young black people see Julius Malema and um, the economic freedom fighters, you know, the spirit of Willie Mandela, they see him as a kind of messiah. They do, you know, and people saw Sura Ramaphosa as a messiah. There was a phrase that was coined, you know, when he came into power, Ramaphoria, you know, as in euphoria. So he was elected straight after Jacob Zuma left, and everybody was so relieved and thankful about that. And this was the messiah, and Sura Ramaphosa would go out into the literally into the streets of Cape Town and he would shake hands with people. Nobody, no black leader had done that before. But he did it. It lasted for about two weeks. And then he retreated, you know, into his own little enclave of extremely wealthy people. He's, he's oblivious. I mean, people are so angry with him. There's an enormous amount of not disappointment, but real anger at the man who's got the capacity but just doesn't have the will. Some people say, oh, he's got to balance, um, you know, disparate groups in his own party. And that's possible. But he, he's not a leader. Yeah, it seems a shame when Mandela had everyone's trust yeah. and they all thought, yes, we believe in the election and we're going to yeah. go. And he yeah. had such a short term. It's a shame with no predecessor he could have just got ready for the next stage of yeah. the quality of the country, maybe. Yeah. And there still isn't. Yeah. I, I think the problem is like many countries when South Africa at the next time South Africa there was a lot of euphoria of the promise of yeah. something better. But the, the systems and the structures didn't change. So the, there was a lot of talk yes. of something better, yeah. but the system needed to change and it needed to change in a very radical way. You need it's structural change. Yeah. Yes. But yeah. it also needed to change in a very radical way that nobody could imagine yes. was willing to do. Yes. And that is one of the problems yeah. So Ramaphosa is just a, a victim of Cape Zulu claiming to a system that is flawed. Yeah. And that is why, for example, you've seen that bill that has passed for the land without compensation. That's a very radical approach. Yeah. But it passed, and that's the question is like, how did it pass? How did it get majority of people to sort of have a lot of support? And even in the public, people are very like, yeah, this is what needs to be done, mm -hmm. despite the lessons from Zimbabwe. This is a lesson there, and everyone knows that it would actually have much more negative impact on South Africa than in, in Zimbabwe. Yeah. But it's still passed because people need that radical change. And what happens is when you're not having clear discussions or having some more structured ways of seeing how you make those big changes, this type of radical moves are the ones that come into play. Yeah. And that's why somebody like Trump Fossa can become president. He'll just sort of continue with the system as it is, and that system is 
grieve in such a way that yeah. it benefits everyone <coughs> in power and they have ways in which if you're not strong enough or you don't have enough yeah. integrity yeah. and you can see from him is that they just make themselves much more richer. So someone like and that's why somebody like Malema is very popular. He's not just popular in South Africa, he's popular in the rest of us. Yeah, you were telling me that that's, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, he's very popular in the rest of us because of the things he says. And when you listen to him, people yeah. go like, he's a bit extreme. Yeah. He is a bit extreme, but he's very popular because the changes that people desire, because there was a promise yeah. of something big after 1994, that people desire something very radical. Yeah. The question is, is it what the economic freedom fighters are, are talking about? Yeah. And they know it likely that he could become the next president yeah, yeah and that doesn't really change because he's going to go from from instead of that what was required in 1974 in terms of bit by bit changing the system and the structure yeah. when that didn't happen it will just have to be a big overhaul and it'll be done by someone <coughs> with extreme views yeah and that doesn't really work for south africa no yeah that's i think that's one of the biggest challenges that is there yeah because even when, when, for example, the xenophobia for it, when it started, and it's because most people from other African countries went into him to, to jobs. South Africa was the place we went to get a better job for most of us, the rest of Africa. Yeah. If you're elect, if you're working in academia, or you're working in health sector, you're a doctor, mm -hmm. they all went down to South Africa to get jobs yeah, yeah. at that time. And it was around the 1990s also, yes. when Mandela came into power and they needed people from get into jobs and a lot of people were employed but also then came that it took a lot of time for that equality to be realized yeah so that's how the xenophobia comes in like how come all these people coming in from the rest of africa getting better jobs while the blacks of africans are not getting the same opportunities yeah yeah so those are so it's like the more the inequality became bigger, yeah. yeah you have to look for an end and there's people within there mm -hmm. trying to create that yeah, but then he says another factor is that I mean people from other African countries have they remember the education was so much better because they hadn't suffered the what in South Africa was known as gutter education. Yeah, you they know, do not have. Yeah, yeah, because at the end of when when education was being deprived of black South Africans, most South African countries had gotten independence and a lot of Africans were getting educated. Yes. So from the 1960s, people from East Africa, West Africa were getting educated and more Africans <coughs> with their degrees, yeah. getting experiences with their different professions, while the blacks and Africans were being deprived of even mm. basic education. So when it was time to start employing people and bringing people of, of black people into positions, into professions, mm. it was very easy to bring in people from other countries. So that's that's the, one of the yeah. things. And then what was required now is to start making it, 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 it making those structural changes. Now removing those inequalities mm -hmm. step by step and i think that's why people are feeling uh let down by anc because anc promised yeah to make those to reduce inequalities by changing yeah. having different systems well you look at the freedom charter you know yeah. you, yes i mean it's, it's like a joke yeah know? yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's the that's i think it's it, it from 1994 to now it's been the changes should have been better not completely it's, it's going to take a lot of time for the how, how much time do you think? Be removed. I don't know. I don't know. If if we keep having the same type of governments, is this gonna take too long? It's gonna take yeah. too long. Yeah. I mean structural change is really difficult. If you look what's yes. going on in Australia at the moment with the yeah. tax cut. Right. You know <laughs> I mean it's it's uh, you know that to me puts the whole thing into a kind of perspective. Yeah. It's really difficult to implement change that is not even radical, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, that's true. Yep. Um, Another question. I have a question about Afro-pessimism. You mentioned that very briefly that you're not Afro-pessimist. How do you well, how do you define how do you see what Afro-pessimism is, and how do you think it relates to the contemporary Black consciousness that you've been talking about? Because yeah. at the same time, I'm hearing there's a lot of radical movement, but uh, is it also radical movement that sort of pessimism in itself? So yeah, I'm yeah. just wondering whether you can talk a little bit more about that. Um, I mean, that term Afro-pessimism, I, I was born in 1948, you know, when apartheid came into power. So my contemporaries, um, my family, my friends, were people who were white supremacists. I mean, 90% of them. They believe that black people were inferior. They are 
people who believe that, they, that, that Africa is doomed to failure, you know, without the, the white man's burden being taken up, the continent will just collapse, you know, it's the dark continent. That was their mindset. Africans are irredeemable, really. Um, I don't have that view. I think that Africans are extremely creative. I mean, just a thing like Ubuntu, which I didn't mention, but it's an African value system, which places enormous value on interrelationships, on the value of communities. You know, you're only a, a, a person is only a person because of other people. You know, so that basic African value, um, I think the West can learn a lot from that. So I don't feel, I mean, and I think that that, that value is what will actually save the world. You know, Western individualism has brought us, I think, to a terrible impasse. Um, so I, and, and I mean, if you look at Nigerians, you know, who do so incredibly well in the US, you know, as, as a group. I mean, extremely gifted, intelligent, um, uh, creative people. Uh, I, I think they're, they're quite astonishing. So, so, I mean, I don't think that African people are inherently, I mean, I don't believe that there's difference in race, you know, I think that our skin colors are different, but um, given the right circumstances, given the correct cultural values, um, over time, uh, things will come right. You know, I really believe that. I mean, I'm asking Edith for how long because... <laughs> <laughs> My long-term view is that if the world isn't destroyed in the next three weeks or so, you know, Africa's got a pretty good chance of actually maybe ultimately rescuing us, you know, from ourselves with a different value system. Yeah. So there yeah. was a question here, a slide. Do you still want to ask the question? One more question. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. I was, uh, was going to say there's still big disparities between the quality of education. Um, are there private and public schools? In or? South Africa. Yeah. Some of the best in the world, literally, in South Africa, and some of them are even state schools. Mm. But then that might be 5%. The schools in South Africa, the, there are areas where teachers don't pitch up for work, they come to school drunk, you know, that sort of thing. I mean, that, that in one of these homelands, the Transkai, which is towards the south of the country, we used to go on holiday there often, and kids were. Kids would walk to school in their beautiful school uniforms along dusty roads, and then three hours later they'd be walking home because the teachers hadn't pitched up. But there, uh, there's got to be maybe a role model or something, I don't know. But there isn't a culture of education. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it is being foisted on people. It's something that they don't necessarily want. You know, it's not the type of education they want. Um, so, yeah. What about uh, Botswana as an example? Botswana is, yeah, Botswana is yeah. one of the few countries in Africa. Because I, I think it's the one country with the longest period yeah. of no recession. That's right, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so you've got, uh, but that was a you know, peculiar piece of history uh, yeah. where, you know, Rhodes was doing his extension up yeah. to the north and they took a, all the tribes got together and yeah. went off to Queen Victoria and said, you know, treat us differently. Yeah, yeah. And so they, they collectively <laughs> took action and and then, of course, they found diamonds, yeah. which helps a yeah. lot. Well, exactly. <laughs> and, they, and they shared the wealth, yeah. right? So, yeah. uh, so that, there, there's exceptions in, in Africa. Yeah, there are. Where, where, you know, and, and perhaps, you know, Africa's not a country, it's a, it's a 
it's a exactly. continent full of lots of countries, yeah. some of which are going to do well and some yeah. which are going to do badly. Yeah. We just kind of focus on the ones that do badly. Yeah. Let's not forget countries like Botswana. Exactly. Yeah. But then Botswana has the advantage also of only having one ethnic group, mm. the Tswana people. Yeah. And there are also some First Nations people who call in the sand, but it's largely one group. Yeah. And if you look at this map of Africa, it was carved up, I mean, like mm. a pie by a drunk person, you know? Countries' borders just slashed all over the place, um, tribes were separated. Um, it's a mess, it's an absolute mess. And that's why you have, I mean, atrocities like what happened in Rwanda, you know, which is not really a country as such. I mean, you know, it's. Um, but, that's, so, but that's why I wonder whether South Africa is a country, really. South Africa? Because it, it's, it's an artificially created it is. like most of Africa. It is. And whereas you've got Botswana, <clears throat> as you said, which was. You know, yeah. There's a grouping that people can yeah. relate to each other and yeah. trust each other. Yes. And they've created a country that I don't know whether they've had a recession yet since yeah. World War II, but I. Well, it's homogenous. It, yeah. And it's, and it's got a resource that and hasn't it, been plundered. Yeah. And it got on with it. Yeah. 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 Right? Small population. Yeah. Small, yeah. Population. small population. Yeah, yeah small population. That, that holds. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say that, um, like you point out, just with the transport issues, you know, unless those. Yeah. And so the tension just continues. It does. It does. And the way people move, actually, because, it, you know, there isn't an, a, an official reallocation of land. But what people are doing at the moment is they are literally land grabbing. So around Cape Town, for example, there are settlements that are springing up on private land. And this is because people are desperate. You know, they want to be close to their places of work. And the Western Cape, which was the original Cape Colony, is actually, as we speak, trying to seek independence, secession from the rest of South Africa. Yeah. It sees itself as different. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's never really blended with the rest of the country. But perhaps that is the reform that's necessary. You know? Yeah, that it will eventually just disintegrate. Yeah. Or realign into yeah, groups realign. that can get on with yeah. the other part. Yeah, and I mean, parts of, um, Limpopo province actually belong in in, <laughs> in Zimbabwe, you know. It's, a, it's, it's an absolute mess. Yeah. So, do you know if there's ever been any interest in renaming the Rhodes Scholarship? Oh, uh, there are all sorts of movements all the time, but you try to change anything to do with Rhodes. So I mean, even Rhodes University, which is where my daughter was um, a student. They've been trying, they, they, I mean, how that got around it, because there was this whole Rhodes Must Fall movement, you know, where his statue was taken down at the University of Cape Town. Yeah. And um, they even tried to get the statue at Oxford University to be removed. It was a very powerful student movement. Um, but Rhodes University is known by many people today as the university formerly known as Rhodes. You know, it, but they don't say Rhodes University. It's a UK. Do you remember what the actual the, the university formerly known as Rhodes? You know, but they'll never say I went to Rhodes University. I went to university formerly known as Rhodes, but we haven't yet got a new name. Yeah. I mean, the Rhodes scholarships. What are they going to do about that name? I don't know. That's, that's not a name for trust. That's a, yeah. It's not a yeah. political thing. That's a legal no, thing. No, the name. You know, if it was a. You've still got to convince the trustees. Yeah, it's, 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 not, it's yeah. not a government. It's a Zimbabwe yeah. trust, you know, so that's a bad problem. Very, very difficult. Yeah. So we had a question up there. Do you see? Yeah. Um, is there a reason why the UN has not become actively involved in this? Because, I mean, people asking for a pay rise, getting shot in the back, things like this. Like, you mean with Mary Kana? Well, with. I think a bit like a special case. It's had a lot of Why? slack cut. Why? I think because it's the rainbow nation. Yeah, there's a lot of corruption. You know, it's all, yeah. Because they're just letting China take over now and, and, and rack up the big debts and China and South Africa's case has been ongoing by China for a long, long time. 
But it's a, I mean, South Africa is a sovereign country, yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it can try to pass resolutions, but it can't interfere yeah. directly into the country. Yeah. It's interfered in Rwanda. It's interfered in other countries. G generally, you have a failed state. Like yeah, I think we there's a failed state. I mean, there's no electricity. There's no electricity. I mean, in, in South Africa, yeah. there is. I mean, don't paint it too black, you know. No. It's, um, no. it's like, yeah. It's, it's functioning, people yeah. live good lives still. Yeah. They, they adjust. I mean, South Africans are incredibly resilient. Mm. You know, and they, they're not very good at facing up to the long-term consequences of what's happening now. Mm. Um, so they carry on. And many of my friends will say to me, we still live good lives, and they do. You know, even with less electricity being switched on during the day than they used to have. They adjust, and they'll say ridiculous things like, "Oh, it's lovely listening to music in the evening by candlelight," <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. So, um, so unless, it, unless someone in South Africa reached out and said, "We're not happy that our uh, president or you know our leader um, is uh, is giving jobs to boys," you know, is is, is um, doing the car directing, we're not. They would have to actually reach out to the UN. Someone within South Africa. Yeah. 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 I mean, unless there is a genocide or something. You know, but like that's, but that's failed state. Yeah. 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 The, UN, the, UN exactly. gets, the, yeah. the reason why the UN can't get involved or in any country is because it's a you know, South African strong military. Yeah. Well, no, they, they don't anymore. Yeah. I mean, the uh, uh, military is not that strong anymore. Yeah. Well, still relatively strong. Yeah, well, relatively. Yeah. Yeah, it's not failed. It's no. not a failed state. It's not a failed military. Yeah. Um, which is what happened in Rwanda. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very far from Rwanda. Or Somalia. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, yeah. It's, so, it's, so, so, so then it's, it's nowhere close to that. Yeah. Even with the UN reaching out to those countries, those are peace speaking nations. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not a first thing about it. Yeah. Because that's what the problem is about it. It's a governance issue. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so it has to be within the internal structure as a sovereign state to resolve mm -hmm. those issues. Yeah. And I think even the way the UN is structured, nobody wants the UN to do that kind of work. No. No one wants That's what I said, it has no jurisdiction. Yeah. 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 But and the thing is, I mean, it's also it's the electorate. When you yeah. get this kind of voter apathy, yeah. you know, people not even bothering to register, yeah. when their parents probably died in the anti-apartheid yeah. struggle, yeah. you know, for that vote, yeah. which they're not bothering to exercise, to me, that's the fundamental core, is that people have given up. And I don't know what happens then. Yeah. And uh, Linda, with the 20% white vote and, and the ANC dropping, is there any evidence to show where the extra votes are coming in from white vote, apart from, say, the quiet people? Well, you know, white people are such a tiny minority, and the DA, the Democratic Alliance, which got 20% of the vote, um, I would say 70% of the members are probably black. A lot of the leadership is black. So what was a white party has become a very mixed party and probably majority black, but with a different um, economic ideology. They are more capitalist aligned, yeah. whereas the ANC pretends to be socialist, but it's not. But you know. that they're getting, they are getting more strength and recognition for their economic aspects with governorship. If 20% are You mean a DA? I think so. I've got yeah. nothing to call it. I have been reading that there's a lot of influence, not so much because it's because of what they've already got, they feel this might have some hope, reverting back to say European influence. Yeah. What do you think? Um, you know, I think that the future lies in the hands of the youth, and the youth are following, I think, will follow the economic freedom fighters. And my little scenario, I mean, for what it's worth, is that the EFF, the Economic Freedom Fighters, will form a coalition with the ANC, which is actually their parent body, and that that will become 
the dominant group, I think, eventually. And the rest will just be rats and mice. It will be a pretense of a two-party system or a democracy, but it will remain a one-party state, which I think will have swung more to the so-called left, but it's also the populist, and that's that, that coalition. And I think it, this is what people are terrified of, actually, is the ANC going into coalition with the economic freedom fighters, which it has to do, actually. It will have to do that. And that will be interesting. So I have a question that is both for you and for Christian. Do you think that these inter Western mining corporations are somewhat complicit you know, in this corruption and they're basically really? propping up you know, this really corrupt and violent yeah. regime? I mean, Western, yeah. if I think of Anglo American, they were instrumental in 1989 in getting talks going between the government and, um, and the ANC. So it was a mining company that was actually the catalyst there. You know, they, their own future, I mean, their own investments depended on peace. Yeah. So they tried to avoid civil war by bringing the two parties together. And Anglo American did wonders. And they still, there's a thing called the Brenthurst Foundation. So it still pours a lot of money into South Africa and it's generally to try to sort of calm these very turbulent waters. But I mean, one thing that, um, two things that the country does have in its favor is a free press. It's a very robust free press, wonderful journalism. And then secondly, it's got a relatively free judiciary, which is a bit wonky at the moment, but um, up to now, we can trust the courts. Yeah, the, the mining companies, uh, the big international ones, so there's, there's kind of two classes of mining companies. There's a sort of privately held, sort of mid-tier to low-tier companies, and then you, uh, who are often now black-owned because of uh, lack of economic empowerment. Um, uh, they are somewhat of a law unto themselves. So I, I wouldn't go as far as calling them corrupt, but I would say that they're a law unto themselves. But the actions of the mining companies. So if you just look at what their incentives are. Uh, you can't move a mine, right? So you, you've just invested, you know, <coughs> you know, ten billion, hundred billion dollars, and you can't get, you can't take yeah. it out. So the biggest paranoia of all mining companies is sovereign risk, you know, because at any moment the government can just come in and say, "That's ours," yeah. right? Thanks for all that investment you put in. Uh, you can go now, yeah. and this happens all the time. Though. So the one huge incentive for a mining company, good, bad, or indifferent, mm -hmm. is stability. They love stability, and mm -hmm. things get unstable. It, and if they have influence, they will they will steer it back to stability. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't mean democracy, autocracy, or any ocracy. They don't, they don't, they don't care which ocracy you go exactly. for. They go for, mining companies go for stability. Self interest. Also. Well, that is their self interest because yeah. you've got this multi-billion dollar investment that you can't move. Yeah, and they pay the leaders to ensure that they have security. Or digital. Yeah, they just, yeah. They well, whatever, 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 the whatever, whatever. The country whatever. are making an enormous amount of money out of these mining companies yep. that, you know, and they say, you, if you give us half of your profits, we'll let you say this. Yeah. But when you've got a situation like the current president, um, his brother-in-law being... enormous amount of money yeah. from mining companies. Yeah. yeah, but that's that mid-tier yeah. down. As I said, once you get into the top tier, they're all listed on the New York Stock Exchange, so they are under US law. Mm -hmm. and, oh, you and don't think they're corrupt? Because <laughs> they're, they're on the stock exchange? No, they're, they're totally amoral. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but bribery, uh, that will sheet home to them in, in numerous courts. Ah, oh, they, they wouldn't even notice what they were doing. No, don't be, don't be, don't, yeah, yeah. Don't be that sceptical. I'm, I'm an ex I've seen them, but but in general, you know, I mean, you're talking big picture here, big movements are made, big movements, you know, they're, they're pretty well governed at a big scale. But once you get down to the smaller scale, it gets to be a bit more rapidly rules type stuff. Are they already using the legal framework? They like chose to 
strong lobby organization, yeah. the institution, it's very easy for them to get to this government and leave the way. As you see them here in Tanzania. Yeah. So even the big or the small mining companies have a whole yeah. lot of insurance. At the same time, yeah. they They can be able to their lobbies, yeah. their lobbyists to influence the ruling yeah. party. They are yeah. going to do it. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah. but just always remember what they're after is stability. That's yeah. That's what they Sure, they want an extra. You know, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's stability at all costs. It is stability, but the, because they can't move their assets. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's their incentive. Yeah. And, you, and yeah. once you understand yeah. that incentive, yeah. sometimes it's a motive for good, right. and sometimes it's not. Yeah. And that's why I, I, my view is it's totally a mm. Yeah. yeah. But do you think that U.S. laws are sufficiently strong to... Uh, at, at macro scale, I mean, you know, you, you wouldn't see, a, you know, some of the, you know, sort of egregious sort of uh, bribery and corruption. That doesn't mean some corruption doesn't occur, because was it under recently um, Anglo Platts, um, you know, suddenly they, because of COVID and all that sort of stuff, yeah. they're... they're, um, they're um, Production in South Africa dropped, mm. uh, and yet their output rose in actual finished platinum. And, and what they've been doing for years was uh, sending concentrate off into, I think, it was Sweden or somewhere, and and so they and they didn't pay uh, royalties on them. Mm. So they've been dodging royalties, and suddenly, and but of course, then the government breaks up and goes, hey, hold on, your output out of South Africa is down. But your actual output in platinum went out. Right. How can that be? And it's because they've been moving concentrate offshore. Yeah. And and uh, you know, but and that doesn't get caught, captured by because right. uh, U.S. law is all about bribery and corruption. You know, you dodging tax in some right. realm. Well, that's fair game. Yeah. Uh, but I think the um, the South African government yeah. caught them out because of that. And, and they nailed them for yeah. it. So, so, it, so it depends on what sort of, but it, the bribery stuff yeah. is at, at large scale becomes very problematic for a US listed company. Yeah. And most of them aren't yeah. big ones. Are. But when another thing that's emerged in South Africa recently is artisanal mine, miners mm. who go to abandoned mines and they start um, mining gold, which is sold illegally on the black market. And I actually read somewhere that the same thing happened in Vietnam. I'm not sure if that's not. Oh, yeah. There's no gold in Vietnam. I just don't know. Because yeah. yeah. that's, I mean, it's, it's interesting that, that that's a new phenomenon. Mm -hmm. so yes, that, that, that's, that's because of technology. Uh, because they'll be mining gold and platinum uh, in Africa for mm -hmm. hundreds of years now. And so the tailings, so again, yeah. you know, the, all that was mined 100 years ago was processed by technology mm -hmm. 100 years ago, which wasn't very extractive. You know, you yeah. had to have very high grades. These days, uh, you, know, you can process ore at half a gram, mm. almost up to 0.3 grams a ton. Uh, back in that you know, yeah. day when, uh, when uh, gold fields was listed by Rose uh, and his pals, uh, you know, you were mining at like four or five mm. grams a ton in, and you would throw away the stuff that had one to two grams yeah. a ton in it. And so you've got all this already broken rock, mm. tailings all over the place there, that more modern technology, processing technology, can now just come in and vacuum yeah. that stuff up. Yeah. And no one knows who owns it anymore because it's all abandoned mm. and all this kind of stuff. So yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's a lot a lot of stuff there in, yeah. in, in, that's happened. Yeah. I guess I just want to make a quick comment about your last slide about what to do better. And I think one of the lessons that were taken away from the success of the East Asian countries is investment in primary school education. Mm -hmm. And through a lot of studies, they found that actually that was investment that had a huge payback. You know, don't prioritize yeah. your universities, you know, invest in primary education. So the education system in South Africa, is it just not receiving investment or like you say, it's just a, the um, culture of not valuing the anything. amount of money spent on education in the budget proportionally is huge. So, and, and this has been the case um, for many years. But 
there's a very strong teaching union <laughs> that I'm pro-union, um, but this teacher union has not been good for the country's education. Um, they go on strike at the drop of the hat. They make what I consider to be unreasonable demands very often. They're unrealistic. Um, so I think that Satu, that's the name of the trade, trade union, um, has not been good for the country. Um, but on the other hand, um, if you look at black parents, there's one thing that a black parent wants desperately for their child, like all parents, and that's a good education, a way out. Yeah. And as I said, I mean, some of the best schools in the world, the same as Zimbabwe, what's that famous school? There's some private school that's as good as Eton. And there are schools like that in South Africa. So there are some excellent schools, but they're not available or accessible to the majority of people. Is that a cost thing? Yeah, it's, a, it's just it's the misspending of, of money. It's it's a government that doesn't know how to spend money properly. I mean, for example, most rural schools don't have flushing toilets. I mean, th th this is a fact. They're called mud schools and you know, you'll hear maybe once or twice a year that a child literally falls down the long drop toilet and dies. You know, that, that happens. So the conditions in rural areas are, are dire. They're dreadful. Um, teachers aren't properly educated. They're not committed. They're really in it, a lot of them, for themselves, you know, to get a higher wage or whatever. And I mean, as far as I'm concerned, teaching is a vocation in a way. You know, it's something that not everybody wants to do or can do, um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a way to get a job. And jobs are very often sold by people in higher positions, you know, to their family members or whatever. So it's, it's that corruption, you know, it's, um, it's a very degraded system, unfortunately, for most people. So we're running out of time. Does anyone want to ask any I'm further questions? Say, so I think the World Bank now has a column for corruption and how much. So you'd hope that bit by bit around the world, those things will start to change. Yeah. You'd hope. Yeah, well, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> but spring is eternal, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Cool. OK, so let's wrap up here. And let's thank Linda for the next one. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.